That's great. Thank you. Perfect. So welcome everyone. My name is Hung. I'm a small farm advising, uh, advisor uh, serving the Inland Empire, so the Riverside and San Benito. Uh, joining me this year are the UC program. Uh, it's Lucy. Lucy, uh, like me from uh, Urban Ag and for, uh, Food System Advisor. Do you want to introduce yourself real fast, Lucy? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Hung was saying, my name is Lucy Diekman, and I'm an Urban Agriculture and Food Systems Advisor with Cooperative Extension serving both Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. Uh, and it's really exciting to be launching this series again and great to have you all with us. And we also have Aparna. Aparna, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Aparna Gazula, the Small Farms and Specialty Crops Advisor in Santa Clara, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties. Welcome to the 2024 Organic Seminar Series. We're excited to have you back. And we have 10 talks lined up for this year. So. Hopefully we'll see you over the next nine weeks. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Mark. We also have Margaret Lloyd, uh, organic, uh, farm, uh, organic and Small Farm Advisor serving Yolo, Solano, and uh, Capital Corridor. I don't think she's on today. Uh, also joining us is Alba. We have Spanish translation available, so please see the Spanish channel tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen to join. Uh, thank you for the generous support uh, of Alba our Cultural Land-Based Training Association for uh, joining us and making this possible. Before we start today, please keep yourself muted until you like to chime in. Feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk by unmuting yourself or writing in the chat. We will monitor the chat. We will also have ample time at the end of the presentation for discussion and question. Uh, feel free to eat during this uh, lunch seminar. It's uh, informal, so, uh, you know, if, yeah. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, joining us today is uh, Eric. Uh, Eric is the research horticulturist coach and lead scientist in the organic production and climate smart farming research at USDA, uh, USDA uh, Agriculture Research Service in Salinas, mm -hmm. where, he, where he has uh, worked since 2001. His current research is in organic vegetable and strawberry production and is focused on cover crops. His current uh, cover crop, weeds, soil fertility management, and biocontrol of insects pests. This occur on farms at the 25 acres of certified organic USDA ARS land that he managed. Eric is passionate about the long-term agriculture research and effective communication of practical research result to farmers and others. Follow this link to learn more about his research and access to his research publication and video. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat. Um, Eric will be chatting about, uh, uh, be presenting on furrow cover cropping to reduce runoff, soil erosion, and weeds. Okay, so uh, you want me to get started, Hong? Yes. Um, do you want me to start? Uh, just let me know when you want me to start the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah the video will come a little bit later. Okay, so hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I it's always a pleasure for me to be able to share some of the interesting research that I, I get to do. Um, and what I'm hoping is that um, we'll have a lot of time for, for dialogue, back and forth questions and answers. So um, uh, to try to facilitate that or make that possible, what I want to do is I'm gonna show you a few introductory slides just to, to kind of set the stage. And then I, um, and then Holmes going to show you a I think it's a nine minute video that I made. Uh, there's also a version of it in Spanish if you wanna um, see that, but the version that will be shown off of uh, Hung's computer will be the one in English. Uh, but on YouTube, there's a version in Spanish that you could see as well. Uh, and then I'd like to have us have a lot of dialogue because um, I know for myself, that's often one of the more interesting parts and uh, uh, exciting parts of a presentation is when I can ask questions. So um, uh, let me start, let's see, how do I advance my slide there? Okay, there we go. So um, I want you to all, just all to know that on my, there's a website that I have and there's a lot of resources there, okay? So I want you to be able to know where it is. You can just type in my name, Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N, -N -N, and uh, organic USDA, and you'll see 
at my website, um, there's all the videos that I've produced, uh, different photos of my research, some of my publications, and you can download those as well as some other things that you might find interesting. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about cover crops and how they can reduce runoff or uh, also reduce the, the, the amount of soil erosion that's coming off in runoff. So this is a picture from um, some of my research uh, fields. I was out here yesterday. Um, this isn't a picture from yesterday, but it's a picture from a few years ago. But what I want you to notice in the picture there, um, and just somebody confirm, can you see my mouse moving there when I'm moving it on the screen? Okay, good. So, uh, you know, after certain kinds of rain events, you can see all this water in the furrows. And see. The, the challenge with that is that that can run off of our farms, go down into the rivers and cause all kinds of soil erosion, uh, but it can also create um, a bunch of problems in the field. So I was walking through a field somewhat like this yesterday in one of our studies, and it was a muddy mess. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we had, if we had some, some vegetation growing in these furrows, that could help us to in, uh, reduce some of the soil erosion, but it's not quite as easy as what I initially thought. So, you know, when I initially started doing, um, trying out different things with growing cover crops and furrows, this is what I was was working with. So you can see here, this is these are 80 inch wide beds and I've got a cereal cover crop planted on the, on the bed top. And, um, you know, often when I grow cover crops, I grow them on a flat field. So I don't have them in on beds, but in some cases we're interested in growing them on beds. And in this case, the reason I was interested in that was because I was trying to figure out a way to use this tool called a roller crimper. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. A roller crimper is a tool that has been talked about quite a bit in places like the Rodale Institute, and they've used it to uh, as a non-chemical way of terminating a cover crop. So you could grow a cover crop and you could roll it down and crimp it or crease, crease the stems and then it would kill. And I thought, boy, what a neat system. I wonder if we can have that work here in California. So the challenge I was concerned about though was I need to grow my cover crops on beds uh, for trying this out here because most of our production is on beds for our vegetable production. Um, but what am I going to do with the with the furrows? Am I going to get a lot of weeds there? And so I thought, well, let me plant a, a different type of cover crop in the furrow. So we put together this tool. And when I say we, I mean myself and my good friend, Jim Leap, who's um, I've worked with for many years. Uh, Jim was a, a, the farm manager at the University of California, um, Santa Cruz uh, farm there. And Jim and I, put this toolbar together. And what we've got is we've got a gandy box here, which is where the seed is. And then there's some tubes that are leading that, uh, carrying that seed down to the furrow. And then the furrow bottom, we've got um, like a rolling cultivator, like what you'd see on a Lilliston. And that's going to slowly and very gently incorporate the, um, the seed into the furrow. Okay, so the idea was we'd have mustard in this case in the furrows and then rye in the bed top. And the reason I wanted mustard in the furrow was because I knew it was easier to kill than rye. Okay, because you can you can drive up cross mustard and it will pretty much kill it. Whereas rye, you can't do that. So I'm so this is a, just a little closer up you can see here. So we're going through the furrow, we're stirring up the furrow bottom a bit there, and the seed is coming down in this tube and then going into the furrow bottom. And it results in something that looks a little bit like this. So you've got our mustard in the furrow bottoms and then our rye in the bed top. So it seemed like, oh, this is growing great. All we gotta do now is bring in our roller crimper and we'll have a perfect system. Well, things aren't always easy in the way you expect them. And so uh, this is this is the, the field a little bit later. And what you can see is um, the rye is at a perfect stage of what I thought for rolling it down. Uh, and I've got these, these uh, markers 
where the furrow is and that's where the mustard was. So I thought, oh, this is a piece of cake. All I gotta do is drive in those furrows. The tractor wheels will crush the mustard and kill it. And then my roller crimper will kill the rye in the bed top. So you, here you can see um, the tractor is sitting in the furrows there and um, we're rolling, here's the roller crimper on the front of it and we're rolling down the rye. It all seemed like it was just gonna work so nicely and I wondered, um, boy, this could transform our systems here. Well, unfortunately, it was a weedy mess. So the reason I'm telling you this is there's a lot of interest in, in this roller crimper, but we have not found that it works well here in California. And this was back in like 2000, um, I think it was like 2010 or so. Now, a lot of several small scale farmers and, and medium and larger scale farmers have tried the roller crimper here in California and they've had similar frustrating experiences with it. So it doesn't grow, it doesn't work very well to kill a cover crop. That was kind of my first try with, a, with growing cover crops in a furrow. And it's not one that I would recommend. Okay, so I don't want you to do that. But what has worked very well and which I've done for more than 10 years now is a different system. And that's where we're growing cover crops in the furrows between plastic mulch covered beds. And this picture shows why this system or one, one aspect of why this system works well. And I'll, I'll get into all the, the, the video, we'll get into the details, but you can see I've, there's a furrow right here on, the, on this side, which is bare. There's no cover crop there. And then we've got a furrow here where there's a mustard cover crop that was grown. And Jim, my friend, Jim Leap is holding water that came out of the, the cover crop furrow and water that came out of the furrow where there was no cover crop. And it should be pretty obvious, the water came, that came out of where we had the cover crop is much clearer than the water where the cover crop was not grown. So even if the runoff is the same from both of those, the quality of the runoff, or in other words, the amount of soil erosion is far less where we grew a cover crop. So the cover crop allows the water to come off the field or as well as infiltrate into the soil, but not carry a whole bunch of soil with it. So, you know, we want to export our, our, our strawberries and our vegetables, but we don't want to export our soil because our soil is our, that's our base that we're growing with. So we don't wanna lose our soil. So this system is that I'm gonna show you in the that we, will be described in the video is what we've been doing for many years. And so I want you to now, um, the, the video is, um, there's one in Spanish, in English here, and then there's also one in Spanish. And uh, maybe um, can somebody else who's on the call here perhaps put into the chat the link to the Spanish version? Uh, in case somebody wants to see it in Spanish. The Spanish version's uh, a little bit longer. The one that uh, Hung will show you is the English version, but if you wanna watch the Spanish version while we're watching the English version, that I think that would be fine, okay. So it's only about an eight minute video. I wanna show the video or Hung will show you the video and then we'll have a lot of time for Q and A, questions and answers and comments. It, Etc. So, how does that sound? Good. All right. So, uh, Hung, you want to go ahead and um, stop my screen share and then go ahead and play the video? Yes. Thank you, Eric. Oh, I do. I need this. I need to hit screen share. Stop. Perfect, Eric. Give me one second. Yeah. No problem. Uh, can you give me a thumb up if you can hear the video when it's like light? California produces more than 80% of the strawberries in the United States. And these systems rely on plastic mulch covered beds to provide many benefits like saving water and suppressing weeds. The plastic also creates sustainability challenges because it's difficult to recycle and because covering most of the field with plastic creates problems with soil erosion and runoff when it rains. 
The erosion and runoff issue really worried me when I began doing organic strawberry research because the strawberry fields that we were setting up on our research farm reminded me of the corrugated metal roof that I grew up on in the, in the tropics. Our roof channeled rain into a tank that gave us our drinking water. And a similar thing happens in strawberry fields when rainwater runs off the plastic in the furrows that drain the ditches that lead to rivers and the ocean. And this is a problem because of the loss of precious topsoil and because it reduces recharge of groundwater below the strawberry fields. We rely on that groundwater for irrigation and for drinking water. The runoff can also carry pesticides and nutrients that pollute fragile ecosystems that need our protection. Planting a winter cereal cover crop like barley in the furrow is a great way to reduce the runoff and soil erosion problems. And some of my colleagues found that this reduced the turbidity or the cloudiness of runoff water by about 70%. But here's the problem. These winter cereal cover crops need to be killed so that they don't get too big and compete with the strawberries. And it's hard to control them in a furrow without a grass selective herbicide. These herbicides are not allowed in organic systems. And so this inspired me and some colleagues to do research to try to identify cover crops that are easy to grow and control without conventional herbicides. And that's what I'll be sharing with you over the next several minutes as I talk about two experiments that we did over a four year period. So this first study was focused on Ida gold mustard. It's the type of mustard that produces the mustard that we eat on our sandwiches. It's also got a hollow stem, like a straw. So sometimes I think of growing mustard in these furrows as a way to put straw back into strawberries. Now in this study, we planted the mustard in mid-November to early December, after we had transplanted the strawberries. And we planted it at two different seeding rates that I'll call 1x and 3x. The 1x rate had about 16 plants per foot of furrow, and the 3x rate had about three times more plants. We let the mustard grow until early February, which was when it was getting to around the height of the bed top. And then we mowed it down with a weed whacker so that it wouldn't kill the strawberries. Right before mowing, we measured the biomass of weeds and mustard shoots, and here's what we found. So in this graph, our y-axis, show biomass in either pounds per 100 feet of furrow or kilograms per 100 meters of furrow. And what you can see is that the 3x seeding rate produced about 60% more mustard shoot biomass than the 1x rate. And you might think that this increase in mustard biomass at the higher seeding rate would do a good job of suppressing weeds. But unfortunately, the weeds still grew really well right along the edge of the plant, both seeding rates. And here's a graph that shows that. So in this graph, we've got weed biomass on the y-axis in either pounds per 100 feet or kilograms per 100 meters of furrow. This is the average weed biomass in a furrow without a cover crop versus weeds in a furrow at the 1x rate and then at the 3x rate. So we can see that mustard cover crops reduced weed biomass by about 30 to 40 percent. But ideally, we'd like the weed biomass to be way down here. And that's a level at which we don't expect that we will be able to produce any seed. Weed seed production in cover crops is a bad thing because it makes a field more weedy over time. So the bad news from this first experiment is that we need to do a lot more to control weeds than just plant a cover crop at a high seeding rate. But the good news is that Ida Gold Mustard was really easy to kill with mowing with our weed whacker. Unlike a cereal cover crop that would have just regrown, when it was mowed, the mustard died right away. So that was a real positive thing that we found in this first experiment. Okay, now for the second experiment. This one was focused on several ways to improve weed suppression. The first thing you might notice is that the cover crop is already at the height of the bed top and the strawberries have not even been transplanted onto those beds yet. Now this is a big difference with experiment one where the cover crop was planted after the strawberries were transplanted. Now, another thing you might notice is that the cover crop in this second experiment has more than just mustard. We actually mix mustard with Sudan grass, which is a warm season cover crop. We hope that the Sudan grass would grow well during the relatively warm period right after planting in late September. 
and shade out the furrows and suppress weeds and then die as the weather cooled in the fall and winter. Now to achieve this earlier planting day, to speed up the planting process and get the cover crop to grow before the winter rains began, we developed this special planter. It allows us to plant the furrows of about one acre of strawberries in one hour and lay a temporary line of drip tape in the furrow at the same time. We were then able to apply just a little bit of water to germinate the cover crop and weeds in the furrow. And then we quickly hand weeded these bare areas near the plastic using this novel hose that I developed specifically for use near plastic. You might want to check it out in this other video and learn how to make one, how to recycle materials. And you can also see it in action. It's pretty cool. You might notice that the cover crop looks thicker on this side of the bed. In this second experiment, we compared the same seeding rate planted in one line versus in three lines. And what we found was that the three line pattern shaded the furrow faster and produced about 50% more biomass, which we think will improve weed suppression and probably do a better job of reducing soil erosion. So here we're removing the drip tape from the furrow so that we can reuse it again and then transplanting the strawberries in early November. Now, the cool thing is that the foot traffic from the transplant crew helped to push down the cover crop to the furrow bottom, and this reduced the amount of weed whacking of the cover crop that was needed later in the winter. We're still trying to understand why the mixture was dominated by mustard in parts of the field and by Sudan grass in other parts, but in both cases, the mixture worked really well to shade out the furrows, and the Sudan grass worked just as planned and it died as the weather cooled. It's been a lot of fun working to put straw back into strawberries and watch this practice spread among farmers in our region. It's not a perfect system yet, but we're making good progress to improve these methods and develop new tools that we think will increase the adoption of this more sustainable and greener way of growing strawberries. So stay tuned as we continue to refine these practices. Take care. Okay, you, so I'm gonna stop sharing and let you uh, take it from there. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I need to share my PowerPoint screen again. Okay, can you see my screen again? Okay, yes, great. Um, awesome. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is I've got a whole bunch of follow up slides. Uh, which I can show you that will hit on different aspects, perhaps of um, of the video. But I've also got some other slides that uh, might address some of your questions. So, uh, what I wanted to see is, if, does anybody have any questions or comments first about about the video? So, just to get us started, this is going to work best if you give me questions. You can either tell them to me verbally, or you could put them in the chat and then maybe somebody uh, can read them out and then um, we can go from there. Yes, Eric, uh, this is Martin. Um, oh, hey, Martin. Hi. Um, when I grew um, strawberries in Santa Maria, um, we would, um, after planting, uh, use sprinklers to kind of set the 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 plants settle in and get irrigation and all that. Do you think that could be done instead of running lines through the furrow for the cover crop? That's a great, that's a great, um, yes, it could, no problem. Um, as long as, well, as long as your planting date of your strawberries and the planting date of the cover crop were in a similar time. Yeah. Uh, yeah so the, the challenge that we have sometimes here in Salinas, which I know that's a little bit different than in Santa Maria, um, is that just say we planted the cover crops in the furrows, um, and I'll, I'll give you a, let me show you an example here. Um, let me move to my next slide, hang on. Is that not moving? Okay, so let's just say here's, um, this is just a, a picture that shows the cover crops uh, in the furrow soon after planting. So one thing I recommend is to plant early and use drip, but um, at that point, the strawberries aren't even planted. So um, 
And the reason I'm suggesting that is sometimes the time we plant our strawberries here in Salinas is not usually until like the first week of November or after that. And so if you if you waited to, you know, put sprinkler pipe on the field and kind of help to set the, you know, irrigate those strawberries a little bit with a sprinkler pipe, the risk you run into is that you're getting close to when the rains are coming. And just say you your mustard hadn't germinated yet. And then you get a huge rainfall event, even even say a not very big rainfall event, say like a half an inch of rain. The challenge is that a half an inch of rain in a field with plastic mulch translates into way over an inch of rain because the plastic is basically concentrated in all that rain into the furrow bottom. And what can happen is you can actually have a blow out of your whole field where you lose the entire uh, field. I'm going to show, I'm just going to zoom way down to a picture at the bottom here, which I'm pretty sure I have. Oops. Hang on. Something happened there. Uh, let me hit sc screen share again. Hold on. Um, hang on a minute here. Um, okay, so let me zoom back way down to the bottom. Can you guys still see my screen? No, we cannot. You can't. Okay, hold on just a minute. Um, sorry, these are the fun parts of uh, Zoom, or I assume sometimes hanging just a minute here. Uh, let me go back to Zoom. Let me go to screen share. And I want to share screen too. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so this is a See how how bad that looks. That's a situation where we had planted the strawberry, the mustard, and the furrows, uh, and we hadn't we hadn't drip irrigated up the furrows, and the erosion was so bad in this field. This is this is not at a research farm. This is on a, a farm in the region, but the erosion was so bad that the the beds at the bottom of the field filled up completely with eroded soil. And the seed that we had planted elsewhere in the field was completely washed out. So, uh, you know, you run a high risk. I'm just going to move back up to another um, picture up here. But you run a high risk of um, not getting a nice stand like this if you don't plant early. So... Yeah, you could use sprinklers or you can wait for the rain, but it's risky. And I've been burned by this a few times. Um, this year, we didn't use drip tape. We, uh, you know, I understand this is this is what happens. You get really busy that time of the year. But our cover crop isn't as good as it would have been if we'd used drip. So I that's why I really like to use drip. Now, sometimes you can actually plant, there's enough moisture in the furrow bottom to actually get a good stand without drip just because there's moisture from when the beds were shaped. But um, that's not always the case. It may depend on the soil type. So yeah, great question, Martin. Anybody else have a question or a thank, comment? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Margaret, now have her hand raised and we have two questions in the chat as well. Yeah, Margaret, hi there. Hey, Eric, how are you? Good to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a, I'm an Eric groupie for sure. So, so, so happy to see all your work all the time. Um, okay. I was curious about um, some of the other observations you've seen, um, you know, other than managing erosion, um, like being able to walk in a muddy field. It sounds like that's... Um, a positive outcome. You can get into a muddy field easier. Um, yeah, curious about other observations and like, you know, I'm thinking about how that might change the environment around those strawberries, um, you know, insects, differences in the insects, differences, differences in like the temperature or humidity, and if that has any impacts on the strawberries plants or the strawberry fruits that are producing. Yeah, great question. We we have not collected data on a lot of those things. There's, you know, a lot of potential um, 
things that we don't know yet. But what I can tell you is um, we've gotten great yields from our strawberries when we've done this. I The strawberry grower that I work with, his name is Roy Fuentes. And this is a practice that I've required that he do for the all the years that he's farmed with me here in Salinas at our USDA site. And for many of those years, Roy has been the the top, if not one of the leading strawberry producers in the whole region. So I don't think it, there's no evidence that it has a negative effect on yield. Um, and so that that's an important one. Um, the cost is really small. You know, it's when you look at the total cost of strawberry production, cover crop in the furrows is a, just a, you know, maybe one to $200 per acre total cost. Uh, you know, that, that's some of our analysis has indicated that. Um, it does uh, help with weed control. So that's a, that's, that's a big benefit. I, you know, I did mention that a high seeding rate is not enough. So like, uh, let me just move, um, let me move to another shot here where I can show you. So like, here's a picture where we've got, um, you know, strawberry, this is three lines of, of, uh, of mustard planted in the furrow bottom versus one line. And the planter that we use allows us to do those three options. So in this one, the, the seed is spread out a little more. In this one, it's just all concentrated in one line. Um, it helps with weed control, but we still like to come in here and clean up the edges with a with a hoe. And so, you know, sometimes weed control in strawberries can be a real, very expensive, especially, uh, you know, if you've got a lot of weeds coming through here, the cover crop is, is helping to suppress those weeds. Now, you have to pay a little bit for that though, because you have to control the cover crop, right? So you, you, you're still getting growth of, of plants there, but it's plants that um, are not weeds. And so um, I, I think that's a benefit because if otherwise we have to go through the furrow bottom and, and you know deal with weed management in there. And in a year, like so in many years, you can't get in there with a tractor. And you know, pretty much once you plant, um, you're stuck out of the field all of December and often much, at least in Selene, is often much of January and February even. So, um, but a cover crop can help to suppress the weeds that are growing in there. Um, in terms of insects, um, we haven't seen any increased problems like with mites or anything like that. Um, so to me, I don't see a lot of negatives. Um, you do have to manage it though. So reduced runoff is good. Uh, it is taking up nitrogen that could potentially uh, leach out of the system or, or you know, be carried off in runoff. Um, does the cover crop increase our yields? I don't think we have evidence to say that it does in, in the short term, but I try to think long-term. So like we're saving our soil. And so, you know, many, many, many years down the line, that's that's positive, right? Um, anyway, that's, that's sort of a, an answer to that. Now, I, I actually, I will say one thing, Margaret, though, you, you raised this good question about changing the environment. You have to be careful with the cover crop so that it doesn't shade the strawberries. If it starts to shade the strawberries, you could have some re, some yield reductions. And, um, let me show you a picture. Um, so like, you know, we're, one thing I've been trying to develop are some tools that can help with this. And one of them is this this mower, which um, we've we developed. It's basically a it's a home lawn mower, which we put some kayak trailer tires onto. It's very lightweight, and it it basically gives the the cover crop like a flat top haircut. And what's awesome about this is that we can go into a cover crop that's you know, a, a foot above the furrow. And rather than having to go in there with a weed whacker and, and worry about hitting the plastic, this mower just flies along there. You can walk through like, there's standing water in there sometimes when I'm walking through with the mower and I can mow that off really nicely, nicely. And it suppresses the cover crop, but it keeps the cover crop there. So that just say we get another big amount of rain next week, 
it's still there and it's still going to help with um, with reducing the runoff. And I don't have data on this, but I'm also positive or I'm, I speculate that it's drying out the furrow bottom. So, so it allows us to quite likely get back into the field sooner than if we didn't have a cover crop there. And it just makes sense because you've got something that's, you know, going through evapotranspiration, it's taking up water, that water's coming from the furrow bottom. So um, that's a tool that we found helpful. If you don't have one of the one of those, this is a just a real simple one. We just take a you know a berry knife, a sickle, put it on the end of a, a long stick, and then we come into the furrow bottom and you can just cut it back that way as well. Just to kind of set the cover crop back so that it's not shading out the strawberry furrow, because you don't want to have shade on that furrow. I mean on, on the bed top. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Thank You're you. Welcome. We have we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Stephanie asks, uh, she's curious to know how the cover crop affect the microclimate in the field. Was there any hot weather during the, this time? And if so, how did the field with the cover crop fare compare with the field without cover crops? Uh, we've only, I haven't done it on a whole field basis, so I can't answer that question. Um, uh, but I, I think, you know, the fact that we're not having issues with yield is a good indication that it's not having a negative effect. Um, so yes, and I kind of addressed some of the some of that question with when I answered Margaret's question a minute ago. Uh, Darlene have another question. Uh, I'm curious if you did any soil analysis prior to planting the mustard and Sudan grass in the second experiment to try to explain the predominance of one over the others in certain areas. Uh, we didn't. That would have been a good. That would have been good to do. But sometimes you forget to do these things. So, um, yeah, we. My gut feeling is that where the, um, you know, the Sudan grass, um, was mustard and Sudan grass when they grow together. Sudan grass is usually not near as competitive as mustard is, and so um, perhaps there were nutrient differences that caused the mustard to to not do as well as the Sudan, but I, I really don't know that. Um, so I don't wanna mislead you. Yeah. I will say we we are not using Sudan grass in our mustard uh, cut do that. No. Do you these are all yeah these are all good questions, uh, but we've we haven't we haven't actually a answered a lot of those in our research on this. Yeah. Do you incorporate the cover crop as green manure? Awesome. I've got a I got a picture to show you that. Yes. Yeah. So for example, what, what we do is that first thing we try to do is we we cut the cover crop back. So let me back up here. So we use either this hand, um, we you could use a weed whacker or you could use a sickle like this, or um, you could use this this mower. Um, after we've done that, we come into the uh, into the beds with this tool that's got a little rototiller. So it's got a mini rototiller that goes in each furrow bottom. And the, the field's gotta be pretty dry to do this. You can't get in there when it's wet. And that very carefully uh, incorporates the residue and then, um, and that mixes it into the soil. And then we come through with this thing that uh, we call the boat. And it's basically, uh, these, are, these are cement filled, um, shoes that kind of ride and that flattens out the bottom of the furrow. Um, let's see, there's, uh, so that it looks kind of like this afterwards, you can see there, but not, not always that much residue. So, um, you know, essentially having a little bit of a tool that, that can incorporate the cover crop is really helpful. And then something that can smooth out the furrow is good. Now, one of the beauties of mustard, and this is why mustard works so well, is that mustard is not, it, its stems break. It's not ropey. You know, it's not gonna tangle around the, um, it's not gonna tangle around the tines of this rototiller. Like if you had a, a grass in there like oats or barley or rye, it's a mess because it's, those, those cover crops are really, really, um, they have long fibers and they tend to uh, tangle things up. Whereas mustard, when you cut it, it just snaps. 
and it snaps into small pieces. So, you know, if you look at this picture here, you can see the pieces of mustard are, they're, they're not very long. And that's really what you want is things that, that break quickly and um, and don't become a problem with, with management. You also want something that, um, you know, when this boat goes through there is gonna smooth out the bottom of that furrow so that when the when the harvest crew is going through there, they don't they don't trip over things because that's an important thing. You want to make it so, so that it's easy for the harvesters to go through there and they can easily have their strawberry carts go down there and they, they don't have any tripping hazards. Yeah, more questions. Thank, thank you. We have one more question. Uh, well, a lot more questions. Uh, Camille asks, any thoughts on low growing plants that could serve uh, some of the purpose without growing taller than the beds? Sometimes I think that Purslane would be ideal cover crop between plastic beds. Um, so I touched a little bit about some of that. Some, this this mustard variety, the uh, or Pacific Gold is a another mustard that doesn't grow as tall and as fast. That's one that can work well. Uh, we've also tried buckwheat, um, but buckwheat is not a winter cover crop. It tends to kill, uh, you know, when it gets colder. Um, it hasn't worked that great. Um, I've thought about things like clovers. Um, the problem always is, can I easily kill it? So what what I what I want is a cover crop that allow me to have a bare or a, a pretty much a dead furrow. I don't want a lot of vegetation in the furrow bottom because that can be a hazard for the pickers. Um, purslane uh, is a summer plant. Um, there's, you know, it's usually considered a weed, although I, I actually like to eat purslane, but because it's such a challenging weed, I would not, and it doesn't grow in the winter time here. I wouldn't think that would be a good one. Um, so what about, you know, yeah. go Sorry, ahead. What about hairy, uh, hairy vetch and, uh, and, um, uh, Gianna grass? Uh, Hairy vetch, that'd be an interesting one. So hairy vetch um, is a vine. And all, the, all those vetches are vines. Uh, that, that might be interesting to try. The challenge would be, you know, can I kill it? Like, I, I'd be a little bit worried that if it got too big, it might be a little bit hard to kill with a rototiller. But I'm not sure. I haven't tried it. So that's a, it's, it sounds like an interesting idea. Um, you know, one one thing is that that would add some nitrogen to the system, which we probably don't want always, um, you know, in, in the strawberry system. Yeah, some of that could carry over to the next crop, but um, it might be worth trying, you know. Could it suppress the weeds? Well, it might it might do all right if you plant it at a high enough seeding rate. Um, so I have not tried that yet. It's You could give it a shot and see what you think. Thank you. Yeah. I have a couple more questions. Uh, were there any concern about increase in pest problem with the cover crop? Did you observe any difference in pest or biocontrol? We haven't seen any problems. You know, my my biggest concerns initially were, um, uh, you know, mites, uh, ligus bugs, things like that. But we have not had, uh, we haven't seen any evidence that the cover crop increases those. Um, there was this insect called the Bagrata bug, which attacked it attacks mustards and all those brassicas. That um, kind of was a bit of a challenge at attacking our cover crop early on, wait many years back, but it's kind of disappeared now. We don't see that insect around anymore. But that one does not become a pest of strawberry. So I was worried that it might take out mustard, but it it doesn't have an effect on strawberries. So I haven't seen any negative effects. This is an issue that we probably need to look more at, though, to see if there's some beneficial, um, you know, insects uh, that are uh, beneficial insects that are improved by by the use of furrow cover cropping. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, Vermiro also uh, mentioned something similar online. He said, "Thank, thank you for the great presentation, and thank you for the translator." Vermiro is a student with uh, Alba, and he he's a uh, for the first question is. Uh, the, the mustard cover, uh, apart from erosion, does it have benefit for some pests that help us combat uh, disease in strawberry? 
So does it attract any beneficial insects for the for the mustard? Um, when it's flowering, so if the mustard's allowed to flower, it, it you do see honeybees in there. Um, and I I think I've also seen some hoverflies. Um, but in, regarding diseases, um, we haven't we haven't seen any issues with that. Uh, we have had zero disease problems in our organic strawberries uh, where we rotate on a four year rotation. So we don't come back to this field, same field for four years. Now I say zero disease issues until last year. Last year, I don't know what happened, but we got wiped out. We had, um, I think it was Fusarium or Macroformina, but we lost a lot of, um, we lost our whole field of strawberries. Uh, I don't. I don't think that was related to the the cover cropping system, though. Um, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Now those Fusarium and Macrofamina are somewhat newer diseases here in Salinas, and um, uh, they they worry me. <laughs> I I don't know uh, that we have that, that we need a lot more information on how rotations can help to manage those. Yeah. I don't know much about that. Thank you, Eric. Um, I, I have a question. Have you think about using straw, uh, straw or chips or things like that? Because our farmers down here, we use that to uh, prevent weeds between the row and that prevent erosion as well in some case, but we don't have rain down here. So erosion erosion is not our main concern. Um, I, I, I have thought about that. In fact, it, it'd be kind of a neat, um, I can see how that could potentially work really well. Like if you could just say you grew, um, a cover crop in in a field that was like, like a grass cover crop yes um in a field that was uh had vegetables in it if you could harvest that cover crop off using some kind of a forage harvester and harvest the cover crop off when it's you know the carbon to nitrogen ratio or the toughness of the of the tissue is quite high and then hold that on the side and then spread that either with some kind of a tool into the strawberry system, I can see how that could really help with erosion control. Um, we haven't tried that, but um, it's an interesting idea. That The challenge always is how expensive is the material? Where does it come from? And how do you, how do you get it into the field? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's an interesting thing to think about um, because, um, you know, last year was a really, really rough year with rain here. We we got a lot of good rain, which was helpful, but boy, it didn't stop raining. And there were a lot of fields that were completely flooded out. Um, and all the plastic that we have in this area contributes to that in some ways because it increases runoff. And so we don't get that so that water soaking into the soil as much as we uh, would be ideal. Uh, and we need that water soak in and help to uh, recharge our aquifers. and. Perhaps a mulch would allow for more of that to happen, uh, but I, I don't know. It'd be in, in, an interesting experiment to run. Thank you. We, we have another question from Maria. She asked, she's a, a, a first year producer at Alba. She was wondering if uh, you've done any research with brassica as cover crops? Uh, we have, well, so, so the mustards are all in the, uh, they're all considered brassicas. Um, I, I have used mustards in my vegetable research and compared it with rye cover crops as well as legume rye mixtures. And um, the mustards work great. Uh, they're easier to manage in some ways because the residue isn't as difficult to um, to deal with. It, it, it chops really nicely. And so you get uh, fewer residue problems later on. Uh, but um, planting a mustard cover crop is more challenging than say planting rye or a legume rye mixture. And that's because the seeds are small. The mustard seeds are really small. So you, when you plant mustard, you have to have a, a good grain drill. You have to be careful. You don't plant too deep, um, but you can get a really nice stand if, you, if you're careful. Um, and, you know, mustards do a really good job of taking up leftover nitrogen, just like a, a rye cover crop does. So, I found them to work really well in vegetable rotations. Thank you, Eric. 
Uh, we have another question that I skipped from Christina. Uh, she said, as far as killing the cover crops, is a pass with a tractor tires enough or is there some regrowth? Can you give us more information about the killing process? Could the residue be a liability either for slipping or stumbling over uh, thick stem? Yeah, so uh, mustard does kill pretty easily. So, but um, usually before, so a tractor wheel will often, what, what I like about that that hollow stemmed variety is that, uh, or species is that when you drive over with a tractor, it pretty much crushes it and, and will kill it. The problem is that we generally have to go in and um, cut the cover crop back before we can drive on it. So, uh, you know, you have to go in with some kind of a, um, either, you know, one of these hand tools or, or a weed whacker or a mower or something to set it back. Um, but just say, just say you went through with, um, with a mower like this, and then you didn't have uh, a rototiller like, like this one. Um, you could just drive back and forth over that, over the mustard several times as soon as the field, let me just, I'm trying to back up here, hang on. So just say, like in this picture, you've gone through, we've mowed it back. As soon as you can get in there with a the tractor, you could just drive back and forth many, many times, and that should uh, kill a lot of the mustard then. You probably still have to get in there with some, uh, and do some handwork to kill some that are, you know, not quite being crushed by the by the tractor wheels. But um, the, the beauty of mustard is it is relatively easy to kill. I've tried grasses and it was a nightmare trying to kill a grass. I mean, you cut it and it just grows back again. You cut it, it, it just again and again and again. It's like you're mowing, mowing a lawn, basically. That's right, that's right. Uh, we, we have a question from Reza. He, he said he has hemlock weed on his farm. Any suggestion on how to remove hemlock weeds? I don't, I'm not sure about that one. So I don't wanna, yeah, sorry. I wish I could help you, but I don't know that weed very well. Uh, we are about almost to one. If you have any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put into the chat. Uh, also feel free to uh, shoot Eric an uh, a, uh, email. Uh, I will put Eric contact in, in the chat room. Uh, in the meantime, we have an evaluation for the workshop. Please take a minute to fill that out. And Hung, Hung did you put in the chat also the link to the, the video in Spanish? Correct, yes. Uh, our staff uh, put it in Spanish, and we have the one in English in there as well. Yeah, awesome. No, it's uh, exciting to get, get a lot of questions, especially if I, I really appreciate um, it. I always enjoy working with the farmers at Alba. So... Um, you know, they've, they've been some of the pioneers in adopting this method. You know, it's, I think there's a time coming in the future where um, uh, hopefully a lot more farmers that are growing things between plastic will be cover cropping because it, it just makes sense. I have a question, Eric. Yeah. Um, about the timing of termination. Like, do you think there's like kind of a huge window in which you could get the benefits, but terminate, like, could you terminate when they're younger and still get some of the benefits or I'm just imagining juggling like logistics or if it takes a long time for someone to do this by hand or something like that, just what's the flexibility in the termination and still getting the benefits? I think there's a lot of flexibility and um, yeah. Yeah. So what what you don't want to have happen is you don't want it to get too tall and shade out the uh, the, the strawberries, but just say you you can't get in there and uh, so I, I well so what I what I tend to do is I want to get a good stand after I get a good stand I want it to get nice growth once it starts getting near the top of the bed you could go through there um, and and just walk in it to push it down to kind of set it back a little bit. And then as you have time, start dealing with uh, killing it, either with a, with a weed whacker or with one of these hand tools. Um, the good thing is, as long as it's not growing up and shading out the strawberries, there's really not any issue. So like, for example, last, about two weeks ago, 
our, our mustard cover crops were starting to get a little bit above the bed top. We knew there was a whole bunch of rain coming in. And so uh, my, my colleagues, uh, the strawberry farmer I work with here, Roy Fuentes at a research farm, he had his crew come in and just kind of chop it back a little bit by hand and step on it and push it down. That, that gives us some time now. So now we don't have to worry about it for the next um, few weeks while it's rain and rainy. It's pretty, there's a lot of standing water in the furrows. So we're, we're kind of okay. Um, and that's what I like about this mower is that it, it sets it back, um, but it doesn't kill it because you still have the, you know, about this much growth that's, that's still alive there. And it will send out a few shoots in the bottom, but it's not gonna send out a lot. So there is a lot of flexibility, I yeah. think, with it. Like here in the Sacramento Valley, starting in like January, like in that January to March time frame, people are starting to like go in there and cut off runners and remove some flowers. Is that happening for you guys too? Is that like, like, cause there's kind of activities happening in here during that time frame. So I can imagine people, you know, starting to walk on it during those months. Yeah, so we're we're often going in and uh, you know doing the hand weeding right around where each transplant is, and so I I think actually the the, cur the cover crops help with that because it it's not as mucky and muddy because you can step on the cover crops and walk through there. Um, uh, we're not usually cutting runners uh, at least with the variety we're growing that early on, but um, we are pulling out weeds that are right within within where the transplant is. We're often opening up the plastic a little bit, um, picking up some of that first fruit that is maybe not, not too good. Um, so there is, I, 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 what I always like to tell people is, don't worry about the mustard. You're not gonna hurt it by walking all over it. So it will set it back. But like, even when we, when we transplant sometimes, you know, it's like, some years it's just barely germinating. I say, don't worry, just go in there, do your thing. And then sure enough, the mustard comes right through it. It's been trampled all over and it, and it survives. Uh, and um, so it's, it's pretty, uh, it, it doesn't hurt it really. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, that's great. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Eric. Uh, great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's one o'clock, so feel free to uh, follow Eric on his website. It's in the chat, and his email and contact is also there. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Alba, for the, uh, for the translation.